Okay, so Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. You have everything that you need. You're a complete spiritual unit. You have everything that you need for life and godliness. It's been given to you. All those blessings are given to you. And that you, uh, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You've been chosen. Before the foundation of the world. Revelation will say that Jesus was slain from the foundations of the world. That the Lord had you in mind at the foundation of the world. He understood. He knows you. He knows your circumstances. He knows your situations in life. He knew the kind of family that you were going to grow up in. He knew that you were going to be here this morning. He knew that you would be sitting here and that I would be on this day. He knows all of this. And he has chosen you to be in him from the foundations of the world. I mean, it's just, I just spend time just, that, it's enough. I mean, we could probably go home now. I mean, if we just sat around and just think about that, that you were chosen from the foundations of the world, that God had you in mind. When Jesus was on the cross, the joy that was set before him, what's the joy that was set before him? It's us. It was you and I. That you're the joy of his life, that he would go to the cross with joy because he knows that you're going to be part of the family. He understands that, and he understands that from the foundation of the world, that all of time, he knows, he understands. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So he made us accepted in the beloved. You were made accepted. God has given you favor, and he makes you to be accepted before him. What he's done in redemption, that blood has created a situation that you are now accepted before God. You were made accepted. You did nothing. We're going to get to that in a second. It's grace that pours out that actually makes you now accepted before God. It's that favor. If you've ever worked a job, you know, I've worked jobs, and you know, when you have favor with your boss, that's a great place to be. It's great. You know, your boss thinks you're great. You can't do anything wrong. You get favor. You get time off. You get to do things that you want to do. You get to fulfill visions, maybe whatever it is. You know, and, and all of these things, and that favor is so valuable. And, when the, and then, of course, you know, the other side of that is when you lose favor. And I've just had a few conversations with guys who are like, yeah, you know, they're, they're out to get me. Now, the place I work, they're just out to get me. They don't like me. It's just, and it's like, wow, yeah, I know what that's like. I understand that. Losing favor. But the Lord has had favor on us that he's going to redeem you and he's going to make you to be accepted made us accepted in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace according to the riches of his grace you have forgiveness we talked about this you know tuesday nights we have a bible study for the young adults 18 to 30 rooted it's what's it's called in at our house and we were talking about really what it is to be a perfect christian what does that look like Perfect Christianity. Do it. Well, what it really is, so I think, is that it's that Christian who comes to the Lord and asks for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, that I can come back and I can be cleansed, that I can be forgiven, that I can, I can stumble, I can fall, I can walk in the flesh, I can do all these things, and yet I can come back to him and I can get forgiveness. I can get into a right relationship with him right now. And that's, and that's what I would define. Is, it's not getting it together. It's not going, because there's something in my mind, maybe in yours too, at least one other person probably. There's, in my mind, I sit back and go, if I could just get this area of my life together. And then, man, I would be in a good spot. Then I would be in a good spot. Then it's almost like I would think in my mind, then I would be accepted before God. 
then God could really love me because I, I'm such an idiot. And this is bad thinking. You're an idiot. <laughs> Accept that fact. We have blown it. We just, we messed up people. And the only way that we can be unmessed up is to come back to him and go, Lord, I need you to forgive me because I've done it again. Because I don't think correctly. I don't think in terms of love. I don't think in terms of reaching out to people. I don't think in terms of self I don't do these things. I, I put myself in the middle. I put myself in the center of my universe. Lord, I need your forgiveness. And he goes, yeah. I'll do better than that. I'll wash you. I'll cleanse your mind. I can build faith into you through the word of God. I can change the very essence of who you are. And the person you are today will not be the person, as you walk with the Lord, will not be the same person five years from now. You'll be a different person. Some of you don't understand this. We know you today. We know you in church. We meet you, and you go, you don't know anybody. You don't know who I was. I remember a man who was in our church in Florida. I probably told you this story, but I can't remember. And uh, alcoholic, drunk, losing his family. His family's leaving. They're getting separated terrible situation. I mean, he is, he is an alcoholic, Lo- about to lose everything. A couple guys in the church are saying, no way. We're going to be with you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to stand at the hospital with you. <laughs> we're going to share the word with you, and we're not letting you go. And he would just be like, I don't want, no, go out. Go away. And they'd be like, no, no, no. You're going to make it. And, you know, you meet him years later, and, and, me, and I, always, I kind of forgot. And it's like, oh, wait a second. Because his kids were in my youth group, I'm like, wait a second. You were that drunk. <laughs> you were that drunk. Yeah, man, a disaster. And now he's leader in the church, going on missions trip. You'd never know. Completely different person. This is what God wants to do. He wants to intervene in our lives. We got to keep going. So we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You can have that this morning if you find yourself sitting here and you're, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you can have forgiveness of your sins. You can be right with God. You can give your life to Jesus Christ today. It is that simple. Verse 13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption, the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. In him you trusted, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is now the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So now you get saved, you hear the word of truth, faith comes in, you go, yes, I believe that. I believe that's true. I believe what the Bible says. Now it's true. And he says, listen, I'm going to seal you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to come and live inside you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote this book. You use 44 different guys, 1,500 year period, and there has one central theme. How does that happen? Because there's one author. Now that author, it lives inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the author of the book living inside of you. Now, as you read the book, you have the author available to you to talk and go, hey, I don't have any idea what this really means. Give me understanding into your word. Well, now he lives inside of you. And I can go, go to the Lord and go, hey, Lord, what's this mean? And he can begin to reveal his word. And his word can literally, and you know that you've had this experience, it jumps off the page. Oh, man, I've never seen that before. You talk to people and go, yeah, I just read this. Ah, oh, it's great. Love it. Man, the word just came alive in a new and fresh way. I need that. Well, it's the spirit of the Lord living inside of you. I remember when I was in college, I, I didn't like math ever. And uh, so when I was high school, you know, in high school, Florida high school, a long time ago, was had terrible schools. So you only needed general math one and two to graduate. I took algebra, failed it. Not being a stupid person. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not doing that again. I mean, that would be dumb. I mean, I failed it once. I just said, my guidance counselor, are you going to go to college? I'm like, sure. He's like, well, you probably ought to take some college prep classes. I'm like, I just really want to get out of here. This is my goal. I need to get out. And he didn't know what to do with me. So I got to college, took this prep test to get into college, and they're like, man, you're dumb as a box of rocks. I mean, they didn't say that, but they 
basically said that because they said, listen, you need to be in college algebra, but there's three classes before this to get to that class, and you need them all. I mean, you just, you're just, you don't know anything. So I spent six years trying to get through those three math classes and <laughs> crammed that two-year degree into four, really, and the, uh, the, I'm trying to remember where I was going with all this. <laughs> The, the, my math teacher had written the math book. And I'm like, oh, man, he really likes math. I'm not sure we're going to get along. But, man, it was so great. Why? Because I'm with the author of the book. And so I go, I, I've got, I don't understand. What? what? I, don't, I don't get this. It was a terrible class. It was a cumulative everything. You know, you take one test, you have to take a quiz, you have to get a 90% to go to the next chapter. I mean, it just took so long to get through this. And then the final was a cumulative final. You didn't pass the class, you take class over. I, I, did the, I think I took them all over again. But I'm with the author of the book. All right, okay, okay. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He wrote the book. Now as we sit back and go, man, Lord, help me understand. Help me know. What, what do I need? Man, you have the Spirit of the Lord living inside of you. He's the guarantee. It's really like that engagement ring. He, the Spirit of the Lord is a guarantee. When the Lord looks down, man, he sees, he sees, when he sees you, oh, man, he sees Christ. Man, yeah, they've been sealed. They have the Holy Spirit inside. Oh, yeah, okay. Verse 15, he says, Therefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, verse 16, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. For the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So this is Paul's first prayer. We're going to get to his third prayer, second prayer, his other prayer in here in chapter 3 here in a second. But here's his prayer that's written down. Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so this is my question. This is a question for me, and I'll, I'll ask you too. It's how do I pray? Does that sound like me? Is that what I'm praying for? We have children, and we worry about our kids. And we want the best for them. We want the best for our grandchildren. I've grand, got six grandchildren, two more this year, so we have eight total this year. And begin to worry about, well, you know, your grandchildren are being raised by your children <laughs> it's like this is, are you, and your children are a lot like you and you're just like this is just a bad situation man they, they need prayer and so what we do is we want to pray and we want to go oh we want to pray that they get that scholarship or go to college and get a job and get a good job so they don't have to live the way i've lived and struggle the way i struggle and they can do better than me and, and i want to pray or i'm just going to pray that they have a nice day really you're going to pray that they have a nice day that's it listen to what paul is saying the wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. What do my children need? What do my grandchildren, my brothers, what does my spouse need? So the wisdom of revelation. Wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. We've got a struggling marriage and I need to pray for my... She needs wisdom and revelation. She's got to live with me. She needs this. That the eyes of their understanding might be enlightened. That they might know what is the hope. Man, that they would know the hope of the calling. Yes. If they get all, if they get just these three lines, everything else takes care of itself. It really does. I mean, if they can understand what it is, the wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, that their eyes would understand and would open, that they would be enlightened, that they might know the hope of His calling, the riches of His glory, of His inheritance, and the excellent greatness of His power. Everything else takes care of itself. How do I pray? Am I praying like that? I know I don't. Am I praying like that for my children, my grandchildren, for my spouse, those people around me, that relative that doesn't know the Lord? And, and we pray things like, get them, Lord. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I get it, I get it. But really, man, they need wisdom and revelation. I, I need to pray this for myself. Lord, I need wisdom and revelation. I need to know you better. I know that I don't know you well enough today. Because there's stuff coming around the corner that I don't know about. There's trials and situations that are coming that I don't know about. And I need you, Lord. I need to know you better. 
Chapter 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, <clears throat> among whom also we all, uh, we all conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others, but God. So we're all dead. We were all dead. We're all dead in trespasses and sins. He says, you walk this way according to the lusts of our flesh, in our minds, according to the course of this world. But verse 4 comes along and says, but God, but God intervened. God steps into our lives and goes, wait, 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 we're going to stop this. God steps into our lives, and if your parents didn't really know the Lord, God steps into our lives and, and begins a new generation that knows the Lord. Those sins, generational sin, no, it's over. That past, we break the chains of that sin when we say yes to Jesus Christ. He's going to create a new person. He's going to change that person. Zacchaeus standing on the side of the road just wants to get a glimpse of Jesus, just wants to see him, but he's a little guy, so he climbs up in a tree, and Jesus is going to stop. He's going to look at the tree, and go, hey, I'm going to have dinner at your house tonight. His life is changed in a moment. Two blind guys sitting by the side of the road, they hear Jesus is coming, they'll say things like... Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David. And so much the crowd goes, shut up. That's my translation. It's quiet. And then Jesus is like, hey, bring, bring those guys up here. Hey, hey let's talk to you. you know, what does Jesus say when he meets them? Why, oh, it's so great. He goes, what can I do for you? <laughs> well, we'd like to see. Okay. No problem. Life changed. We're not going to stay the same. Our lives are going to change. Our minds are going to change. We're going to become more like Him, more and more like Him every day. As we pray, especially those kinds of prayers, He's going to begin to do this. He's going to intervene. Verse 4, who's rich in mercy, but God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. He raised us up together, just made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith that's not of yourselves. It is, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. So it's by grace that you've been saved. It's not of works because then we'd be able to boast. Some people would say, well, I've done better. I've done more for Christ. And I'm, I'm, this is why I should be let in. Because I've really accomplished this thing. I've really conquered this thing in my life. I've really stepped up and I've had some self-discipline. I'm more disciplined than other people. And so we would all sit around and boast in our disciplines and how, how spiritual we are. And he goes, no, it's actually none of that. It's going to be by grace that you've been saved. And as you go down the road a little bit, you know, you'd think after a while, you'd get it together. <laughs> Been doing, walking with the Lord now for 30 years-ish. And you'd think I'd have it together. <laughs> Just, I didn't. no, it's by grace. You go down the road a little bit, it, I still bring nothing to the table. It's just His grace. It's all Him. It's a, you know, it's a, it, the picture is the Spirit of the Lord behind you, shoving you the direction of Jesus. And Jesus over there to catch you, as if I had something to do with it. I yielded myself. I said, yes, I by faith believe the, I believe the word. And I'm, I'm vaulted into the arms of Christ. And he says, it's grace. And it'll be grace five years from now. It'll be grace ten 30 years from now, it'll still be his grace. That's what gives you place. That's what gives you access to his throne. Where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
oftentimes we want to think that there's some great work, there's some big thing, that I'm going to do something, I'm going to be Billy Graham, I'm going to be some great thing, I'm going to go to some other country, God's going to do some great work for me, I'm going to go to work at this company, and, and everyone at that company is going to get saved, and I'm going to be amazing, and I'm going to have this amazing testimony, and, I'll, and finally, and I don't think so. <laughs> Not that that couldn't happen, it could happen. But I think oftentimes the work that God has set before us, there's so, they're just a multitude of little, almost seemingly meaningless things that pile up. And we look back and go, what? And Jesus goes, no, that cold water, that drink? And you go, I don't, I don't remember that. He goes, yeah, yeah. What you did for the least, you did for me. What? I was going to do something great, and I actually didn't do anything great at all. Oh, no, 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 that wasn't how it works. That's not the economy of God. God comes along and goes, he, oh, he sees that. He, sees, he can see a sparrow and what's happening in the life of a sparrow. He knows what's going on in your life. And if you will submit yourself, if I will submit myself to him and just go, Lord, you take this life, you do whatever. He goes, I got works for you. But don't get too excited. Don't get excited about those works. Remember, the disciples went off Gave him power, casting out demons, people are getting healed, sharing the word with people. It's so exciting. Man, man, they came back to Jesus. Man, even the demons are subject to us. It's so cool. Yes. He's like, don't get excited about that. <laughs> get excited about what? That your names are lit, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Get excited that you have salvation. That puts salvation pretty high. <laughs> I mean, that was a big deal. They were fired up. He goes, no, 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 get excited about salvation. Yeah, you are in. And so, what are these works, man? The Lord's just going to open. It's, it's a byproduct of your relationship with him. I'm going to walk out. Stuff's going to happen. Good works. Lord, just lead me. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to conjure those things up. I don't have to do that. I'm just going to step through open doors as the door opens for you to do good works in life, to help people out, to love people, to give that cold water, whatever that might seem meaningless to us, and yet the Lord's economy, they are great things. Chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, <clears throat> by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been made known, uh, was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been, has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, the partakers of the, his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by an effective working of his power. So Paul starts chapter 3, and he says, This reason, I, uh, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Now, uh, he's going to write this from prison. And, uh, but he doesn't say, I'm a prisoner of Rome. Doesn't really seem to talk about the fact that this is a terrible situation that he's in. He sits back and says, prisoner of Jesus Christ. For you. I've, you know, been to a lot of crazy countries, and I often thought, you know, and if I get arrested, in my mind I thought, well, hopefully when I don't come home, my wife will call probably my older brother, <laughs> and somehow they will cut some money, and they can bribe somebody to get me out of jail. I mean, that, in my mind, that's the plan. I'm just like, you know, I've seen Locked Up Abroad. I've seen the show. I mean, it's like I am not interested in spending any time in a foreign prison. And so I think I've been to a lot of different countries, a lot of different places, and I just think, man, I, that's how, I, honey, that's how this is going to go. And so they, but Paul doesn't seem to go there at all. He's like, yeah, get me out of here. Let's raise some money and bribe somebody and get me out. If we just give them a little bit of money, I can get a slip out of here in the middle of the night, cross the border. But that's good. I'll just keep going. Keep my ministry going. Keep this ministry alive. Send money now. You know, and I can get out of prison. Paul doesn't seem to go there. He says, I'm here for Christ. I, I'm a prisoner for Christ. I am where I am today because of Christ. You are where you are right now 
because of Christ. If the Lord wanted you in a different place, in a different situation, I've got to believe that I would be in a different situation. That's how big God is. He would change my scenario. If he really wanted me some other, I'd be in another scenario. That's what I believe. Because God is that big. But there's the tendency to go, no, 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 my scenario is terrible. This is a terrible situation. I need to get out of this situation. We spend all of our time worrying and trying to figure out and striving to get, you know, this job, this thing, my boss, the best, this marriage, this the monster children I have. Ah, all this stuff, man, get me out of here. I need to be beamed up something, somehow. And But I've got to believe, hey, the Lord's got me exactly where I want me. He's putting situations in my life, and he's in complete control of all those situations. There's nothing escaping him at all. He knows exactly who you are. He knows how many hairs are on your head or lack thereof. He knows everything about you. And so, therefore, he can take care of your current situation. And so I just trust him. I live out my day today. Today has enough worries of its own. I don't need to worry about tomorrow. So I'm going to do today. I'm going to trust the Lord. Lord, you got me here today. The amount of money I have in the bank account today is the amount of money you apparently want me to have today. Because you know me. And if there was too much there, he, I'd freak out. Maybe. I'd like to take my chances, but, you know. It's a... <laughs> the Lord knows. He's in control. Paul understands this. I'm a prisoner of Christ. No Rome, no problem. He doesn't care. He's not bent at all. He's like, I can write letters from here. Sit under prison guards, share the gospel. I've got a captive audience around me. This is fantastic. Verse 6 says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promises in Christ through the gospel. And I just kind of honed in on that whole being partakers of his promise in Christ. Partakers of his promise. And I asked myself the question, am I really a partaker of his promises? Peter would call them great and precious promises. Am I really a partaker? Am I really taking in those promises of God? You know, there's whole books. They'll take the promises of God and they'll categorize them all. You can put them in categories and hear all the promises, hear all these Bible verses. You can Google. Don't do it now. You can Google the promises of God. It all comes up. All kinds of stuff comes up. And what are those promises? Am I really taking hold of those promises? Am I really sitting back and saying in my prayer, like, Lord, this is what you've put me. You said you never leave me or forsake me, but the situation I'm in, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know if that really seems true right now. Seems like maybe you're not around. And your faith is being tested. And you're in those moments where you're just like, Lord, I don't know where you are. But I'm going to bank on your promises. I'm going to leave, believe by faith in the things that I can't see. And that he said some things to me that are pretty radical and pretty awesome. And I'm going to trust you for that. And that's when the Lord, I think that's when the Lord, and I think it's where he perks up. I mean, that's a silly thing to say. But the, I mean, the Lord gets it. We get the Lord's attention because he loves faith. He loves people of faith. And we start to go, okay, Lord, I can't see it, but I believe that it's true. And I'm going to operate as if it's true. And you take those steps and you just begin to walk out that life with him. And he goes, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Why? Because he wants me dependent on him. He gives me situations that I go, no, no, I don't know if I can, I don't know. I told this story before. I'm going to tell it again because I can't remember if I told you or not. Kids are little. I had five children, little kids, little, t- little guys. And, um, and I remember... Actually, it's Morgan. I have to give her a dollar because I told her if I ever use this illustration, I'd give him a dollar, <clears throat> not including inflation. That was like 25 years ago. But um, hey, Morgan, I like, hey, we need to unload the groceries out of the back of the car. And here's it. Why don't you get that 40-pound bag of dog food and bring it in? And I just leave. I just walk away. And before it's even touched, she doesn't even touch it. I can't do it. Can't do that. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Can't do it. I'm like, you got it. You have to do this. And I just walk inside. And she's trying to figure out what to do. And she's standing there. Look, it's massive. It's bigger than her, really. It's awesome. And so, and so eventually, just like you just got it. And I come back, get some more groceries. You got it. You've got to do this. You just got to do it. And so the bag pulls it out of the car. Let's hit the ground. 
Picks up one end, drags the bag in, and, and uh, four stairs up onto the porch, into the event. Takes forever. Finally gets it into the house. See, I told you you could do it. Sounds mean. Wasn't going to let her in the house. That would have been mean. <laughs> You're not coming in. You need to get that food in this house. It's your job. Why? Because I know she can do it. I believe she can do it. She just needs to figure it out. But so many times the Lord comes down to us. He goes, here's what I want you to do. I want you to begin to pray for that person, your enemy that works with you. I want you to pray for them. No, Lord, I ain't doing that. <laughs> yeah, we don't say it out loud like that. We just don't do it. Pray for your enemies. I, I, don't, I don't actually have that many enemies, but we do. We've got people that we disagree with. We have people we don't like. Rub us the wrong way. The Lord comes along, I need you to pray for them. I need you to do this thing. I need you to step out in faith. I want you to do something spiritual. I want you to lead a Bible study. I want you to share a verse with somebody. I want you to share the Lord with somebody. We go, no, 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 no. Can't do it. Just can't do it. And the Lord's going, no, 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 you got this. Some of your house gets sick. You can go to the hospital. And now you're going through that whole situation. You go, Lord, I, I do not want to do this. I don't want to go down this road difficult. I don't know where it ends. I don't know where it ends. I don't even want to go down that road. And he goes, you got this. You can do this. Because I'm with you. But I need you to depend on me. If it's going to depend on you, it's not going to work. Am I taking hold of the promises of the Lord? Am I looking to the promises? Am I looking to his word and finding hope? All right, we got to hustle. Verse 8, to me whom, who am the least, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. A good translation is the inexhaustible treasures. That I should preach the inexhaustible treasures of Christ. Oh, man, they're massive. And he says, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery from the beginning of all the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ, Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so what's he talking about here? He's really talking about the, the establishment of the church. That some would call this really a, a, the third race. You have Jews and we have Gentiles and we have the church. And he's going to establish the church. And in Old Testament prophecies, they're looking forward and they, they sort of outline that prophecy like mountains. And so they see this and they see this and they see this coming. And they see the second coming of Christ. And there's a valley and we would call that the church age, this dispensation, this moment of grace where Christ is going to come as a suffering Messiah, sort of miss that one, and then, he's going to, and then the church is going to exist, and kind of, they kind of miss that one. And so Paul would come along and say, man, this has been revealed to us, and this is what it's all about. Man, it's the church. The church is going to exist now. Man, it's going to be unbelievable. And really, uh, the commentators would say that really verses 2 through 13 is like a parenthesis. Like he really started to tell you his prayer in chapter 3, which he's going to get to in verse 14. But he gets sidetracked to sit back and go, man, it's, it's about the body. It's about this Christ, this manifold wisdom of God. And what he had unplanned, nobody saw it coming. Now it's been revealed to us. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you not lose heart at my tribulations, for which is your glory. And so, I love these kind of words. It says, boldness and access with confidence through faith. Boldness and access with confidence through faith. That we can have boldness now as we come to the throne. We have confidence in him. And it's that boldness and confidence as we walk out. Why? Because I have the... Spirit of the Lord living inside of me. That there's nothing. It's, that, that should create a certain amount of boldness. It should create a certain amount of confidence. It should create us sit back and say, hey, we can, we can run in. Hebrews chapter 4, that we have access to the throne of God. He says, when, when, it, when you're weak, when you're at your weakest, this is when I should run in with confidence and boldness. I'm not 
I don't need to come in the side door. I don't need to sneak in. I don't need to go, well, maybe if I, if I could get in, Lord, if, you, if there's any chance you might want to listen to me, then maybe I could come in and pray and just present. No, not like that at all. He says, no, you just come in. Why? Because you're a child of God. You, you have this confidence and access to him. And why? Really, it's because of the church because of this creation, because of what Christ has done on the cross for us. He has brought us in. This is the picture of the tabernacle with the, the veil hanging before the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is the very presence of God. Jesus dies on the cross, and that veil is torn from top to bottom. It's signal. It's a sign. I mean, the place got dark. Rocks break in half. All of these things that are happening, that veil is ripped. We're not sure how thick it is, but there's different thicknesses. I mean, it, was no, it, wasn't, it wasn't just some little curtain. It was a thick thing, a heavy weight thing, and top, from there to down. What's this saying? It's saying, now you have, through him, I can come into the very presence of God. It was reserved for the high priest. Only once a year would he go in. And they would, they would they say they would put a, a rope around his ankle because he drops dead in the presence of God. He does something wrong. We need to retrieve his body. I mean, it was just like... And now, and now, now you can come in. Now that you have it, you and I have access to the throne. I love it. I don't do this as much. I, I try to, but I forget. And, you know, when you're talking to somebody and they're telling you their situation, and then somebody spiritual around will go, let's pray for that right now. I mean, I love that. I, I don't know. I forget. I just forget sometimes. Let's pray for it right now. It's like, yeah, yeah. Well, let's pray for that right now for crying out loud. I mean, we should be doing that. Why? Because we have access to the throne. We can take care of this right now. Let's go to the throne and find out what's going on. That is, you pray for your children, your grandchildren, your spouses, and all these other people in your life that are crazy. You're going to pray for them, and you're going to say, man, they need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I'm going to go to the throne right now. I have access to the Father. The Father will hear and listen and loves me and cares about me. and He, cares. he knows what happens to the sparrow. He knows what happens to me. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has got enough evil of its own. It's, it's today, it's right now, this relationship that I have with the Lord. And we have boldness and confidence, access. Man, it's great. Nowhere in time has this been available except to us at the church. The Old Testament guys would much rather sit here than where they were. Mightily used of God, read Hebrews chapter 11, great chapter, great book, you should read it. You read that, man, subdued kingdoms. Shut the mouths of lions. The dead were brought back to life. I mean, crazy things happen. And by all this by faith, Hebrews chapter 11, all this by faith. Maui. And they would much rather sit here. They would much rather be in a place where you go, well, we get the Holy Spirit in, dwell in us. We get to be the temple. David would sit back and say, Lord, take not your spirit from me. Well, he understood what it was to have the Spirit of the Lord come upon him and then go, whoa, Man, where, where I want that. I want to be in that place all the time. And that's the, that's the position we're in, to have that all the time, the Spirit of the Lord. This is what it's all about. It's the Spirit of the Lord now working inside of you so that you know how to pray, so you know who to pray for, you know what to do. All right. Verse 14. Holy smokes. For this reason I bow my knee. This is the second prayer. This is really where he started for this reason in verse 1, but now he's going to come back to it. He got a little distracted. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family and earth is named. I thought for a second there about posture. You know, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder, you know, are we doing that? Do I do that? I know I don't do it very often. That, you know, just to sit back and get on my knees before the Father. Just to pray before Him. He's the King of glory. Can I not bow before Him? Well, you don't understand. You know, I've got knee problems and leg problems. I can't bow down very And that's true. I can't. My, bat, my knee is crazy. It hurts. It hurts to get up. Get out. I lay in bed. I can lay before the Father. I can take a separate moment to sit back and go, you know what? I'm going to prostrate myself. I'm going to get on my knees before the Lord. I'm going to physically submit myself to the King of glory. We don't do that. We make excuses. We go, I'm bowing in my heart. Great. 
Now cut it out. It's just, we need to... Man, this is what he's saying, man. I, I'm going on my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven is named, <clears throat> that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in your inner man. Well, that's what we need. I need to be strengthened in my inner man. I need to have that kind of strength. Where's that going to come from? As I spend time in the Word, I spend time in quiet time with Him. I gain something that's going to give me strength internally because the world is a crazy place and floods happen and fires happen and things are going to devastate us. Crazy children are going to happen in our lives. Spouses are going to happen in our lives. Stuff's going to happen that we don't agree with and life gets hard. Jobs get lost. Stuff happens. And you're going to need strength to survive those things. We will survive. We survive physical things that happen to us. But the things that really help us through those times, the tough times, is going to be what's going on inside. What's going on in your mind and your heart? Is my heart and my mind really submitted to the Lord? Am I really going after the Lord? Am I really seeking the Lord? Do I really trust the Lord with my life? And when the things that go around me and go... I don't understand. It all seems out of control. Do I trust the Lord with my life? That's where I need to be. That's the kind of strength that will get me through the hard times. It's that strength through His Spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. That word dwell, of course, means that He is to be at home. It's to be at home. That the Lord wants to be at home in your heart and your mind. He wants to find that place, a very comfortable place that he can dwell. The Spirit of the Lord is going to dwell inside of you in that body. Now, is that a comfortable place for him to be? Or do you go, well, I don't really want him in my mind. Not with the way I've been thinking. Or no, we've got to remove some stuff. I mean, if this was our house, we go, no, there's stuff on the walls there. Wouldn't really want the Lord to see that. Well, there's that closet, that, that secret closet that, you know, I don't really give them access to that. If I was to come over to your house for dinner and, uh, you know, I were to immediately walk in, maybe we don't really know, we don't really know each other very well, and I was to walk in, thanks for the invite, and I was to immediately go to your bedroom and open your closets, like you'd be creeped out, right? That's really, really strange. <laughs> Like, what's, what's wrong? What are you doing in my room? This actually happened to me. <laughs> Showing somebody around the house, they're just opening all the closets. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you, do? what are you doing? This is weird. This is weird. And yet, the same sort of thing, that sort of uncomfortable, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah. You just stay in the family room there. You just need to, you know, you're getting, sometimes we do that with the Lord. Like, Lord, now you have 80% of my life completely yours, Lord. I give you 80%. There's a hymn. I don't think it exists. But at least we'd be honest. Lord, I surrender 80%. It's all yours. All 80%. But we just want to hold on to stuff. We want to hold on to the flesh of our lives. We want to keep things for ourselves. No, that's my thing. Well, I'm, that's my personal life. That's what I, you know, that's what I do. It's ridiculous. The things that the Lord sees, it says in Matthew 6, the Lord sees in secret. The Lord wants our secret life, you bowing down before him where nobody sees and nobody knows, and you're not going to go up and tell everybody how you did it. Oh, I was just praying. I was on my knees praying for you. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to do it without telling it. You might tell that to your crazy children. I'm going to pray for you. A great threat, actually. I'm going to turn you over to the king of glory. He'll start messing with you. But... He sees in secret, sees that bowing, sees that prostrate person. He says, Matthew 6, is he reward you openly. He sees that. And yet we have this secret life over here that we go, well, I sure hope nobody sees this. <sighs> this is like, well, that's my private life. Well, the Lord sees it all. There's nothing hidden. I'm naked and of to him whom I must give an account. I can't get away with anything. It's it's." Gloriously terrible. So he wants to dwell. He wants to be at home in. It's you being rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, 
the length, the depth, and the height. It's four dimensions. All the dimensions of the Lord that are listed there. He wants you to understand this. But I, what was really interesting to me is it says, with all the saints. He wants you to have those dimensions. He wants you to understand who the Lord is and how great he is. But it's in the context of the church. It's in the context of with other people. I find that extremely annoying. It's like, you know, I just want to do my thing. I want to have my Christian life and walk it out by myself. I don't need anybody else. And the Lord comes along and says, really how you're going to find all of these things, all this depth, it's going to be because we, we rub elbows with other people. Because you shared a story with me that you went through something and how, the, how you saw the Lord. I'm going, I would have never had that experience. I would have never known had you not been here. And I'm going to share things about what happened in my life. And you're going to go, I would have had no idea. I can't believe that you went through that. And man, how great the Lord was and your testimony. And all that, that all comes through the context of this being together with the saints to know what the width and the length and the depth. Otherwise, we may only want, know one dimension our whole lives. And we'll go, yeah, the Lord's pretty good. It's like, it's awesome. It's awesome. And what he's doing in some other country where they have nothing. What he's doing to flood victims in Texas and what, how the Lord is showing himself strong. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To be filled with the fullness of God. I want to be filled with the fullness of God. What does that look like? I heard a great illustration. You know, it would be like taking a jar over to the Atlantic Ocean and, and filling it up and go, this is full of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the Atlantic Ocean is pretty big. It's obviously not containing all that. God is infinite and I am finite. And yet, I can be filled with the fullness of God in that same picture. So I want to pray now, Lord, increase my capacity to know you. I want to increase my capacity to understand you. I don't want to be satisfied with the situation that I'm in and how much I know you today. I want to know you bigger and better. I want that to be a barrel and still be overflowing, and it'll still be finite. Verse 20, I'm going to come in for a landing here. Now him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I really thought I knew what this verse meant. And last night I realized about 9.30, I'm like, I actually don't know what this means. Because it's so simple for me. Because the way I was thinking was that, you know, because I want to put myself in the middle of all of this. I want to put myself at the center and go, well, that God's going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think and that we're going to do some great stuff together. That God's going to be awesome and he's going to be magnified and it's going to be so cool and I'm going to be so cool and he's going to do these great things above all that we ask. Or think. Okay, Lord, what can I think of? And you're going to go beyond that in my life. And I think God wants to do great things and I think he wants to have great visions for our life and all of this. And yet, I think in the context, <laughs> that's not it at all. If we read on to four, and I'm not allowed to go that far, <laughs> but we don't have time anyway. But it's the context is the church. He's just been talking about the church the whole time. What's exceedingly abundantly above all that he wants to do? Well, that's in the church. This is the body of Christ. It's going to be exceedingly great. And I think we should have great dreams and big ideas. I want to see all of Fluvanna saved. I want to see all these seats filled. I mean, if we were, all these seats were filled, man, it's crazy. You wouldn't even be able to find a parking spot. We definitely don't have enough parking. You have to park on the grass. People would start complaining because all the I had to come in, I had to park in the grass, and I had to sit on the front row. It's just a terrible situation. You know? You get, I came in, you got an in seat, something. We'd have to have ushers. Ushers would have to go, listen, can you slide in? You ready? No, I don't want to slide in. I got to get here early to get this in seat. This is my, let them climb over me. This happens. I'm telling you, this is exactly how it goes. And then people are going, and we're all cranky because so, the place is so full. But yes, we want to have these big, we want to have these big, we want to go to third service on Saturday nights. And then the band's going to complain. because like, what, you want to go show up Saturday and Sunday? I mean, are you kidding me? This is crazy. But yeah, we want to have those kind of problems. We want to have those big dreams. But the context is not me in this center. Christ already owns the center. It's all about him. It's about what he wants to do and for his glory so that we would understand this manifold wisdom of God as a body, that we would come together in unity, which we're going to talk about in chapter 4. As we walk out this light, we're going to do this in the unity of him. And he will be glorified, and he will be great, and we'll all sit back and go, man, praise the Lord. He's doing so much. Amen. Hey, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the body of Christ. 
Give us a depth of insight that we haven't had before. Give us wisdom beyond our years. Give us a knowledge into the scriptures that doesn't come by any human means, but just by you, Lord. Fill us with the fullness of God. Pour out your spirit upon us. Give us eyes to see as we read your word this week that it would just come alive off the page. It would change us, Lord, in new and dynamic ways. Give us the vision to see all the dimensions of who you are as we worship together with each other. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.